computer. Great. Thank you so much, Jason, for making time to, to have a chat. And um, I've, like we met at the uh, Commonwealth Secretariat in October of this year. Um, yeah. And I was just amazed by your long trajectory um, both with, with the regenerative world, but, but also even before that with the whole green building world and um, living building challenge and green building council and all that. So, so I would love to just um, hear a little bit more about your trajectory, how you got into all this and particularly um, the state of kind of the regeneration rising in Australia, where I think you've been a key player of having um, been the bridge to bring Ben and Bill and Pamela to Australia. So. Yeah, good. I mean, my it's really rooted in my personal journey and kind of the formative teenage years, you know, and what we experience as teenagers growing up in American high schools. Mm. Uh, but I, I came from a very, I wouldn't say conservative, but Republican family. Um, nothing sustainable, nothing organic in my life as a kid. We lived in a kind of a suburban community in Maryland, Columbia, Maryland, which was an experimental plan unit development in the 60s by a guy named James Rouse, um, which was kind of cul-de-sac, you know, 20th century poster child of suburban sprawl. And then my father got a job in New York when I was 11 and we moved to the suburbs of New Jersey, which was kind of, so my, I guess the geography of where I grew up in two different places from an adolescent and teenage played a pivotal role in my later year discovering the built environment as the system I wanted to play in. Mm. Um, particularly in high school, um, I was, you know, an interesting kid and I was very curious about life. I was called myself an omnologist, which is a, you know, a lover of everything and music, art, science, you name it. Um, but I got into drugs and alcohol pretty early. So I was a very drug addicted teen. And I used to kind of try and contemplate or process, you know, what I was experiencing in high school with my peers. I remember sitting around the room with them and understanding why are we all together, this group of, of boys or teenagers, and, and why are we doing the things we're doing? And I remember a day, like, pointing out that every single one of us, about 12 of us in the room, were coming from divorced, divorced parents. Wow. Um, so I was like, wow, that's an interesting pattern. Um, I went divorce, 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 divorce. And then, oh, where are the kids doing this stuff? I'm like this, this is like textbook to me. <laughs> and I was trying to understand, I was too young. Um, hadn't lived my life a bit. I haven't been worldly or been out, you know, traveling the world a bit. So I, I just didn't know what to do with that. Or, you know, the patterns that I saw in society when I was seeing it, I didn't really understand. Um, I, you know, went to college in Colorado and that was my first time off the East Coast and kind of a different, slower way of life it was more, you know, the first time I was surrounded by people that were growing pot, but also like organic food. I was exposed to this kind of more green life when I was in Colorado and I loved it. Um, a lot of my friends, we grew our own food and spent a lot of time in the mountains hiking and climbing. So it was kind of like, it was great for me to transition. Um, I still carried my problems with me. Um, and when I got out of school, I went back to New York City and, you know, didn't really feel like I had purpose. I didn't feel like I knew what I wanted to do. I default was working in a construction company to get, you know, just to have a day job and pay the bills. I was a project manager at a, at a construction firm in New York. I was studying fashion design in evenings. I liked fashion. I lived in Florence, Italy for a while during college, um, but really didn't feel like I had I had lots of ideas, but never really fulfilled any of them. <laughs> I felt kind of lost as a young, as a, as a young twenty-year-old, something. And um, I was still grappling with severe addiction at that point. And I, right at the end of college, I had lost a fiance. And what like that kind of a high school sweetheart was killed in a car accident in Vermont, and that kind of triggered a deeper level of addiction. And so this was from nineteen ninety-eight to two thousand, and I you know, really dark two years for me. Um, very lost mentally, emotionally, and, and didn't really feel purpose in life. And wound up checking myself into a rehab clinic in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It was the winter after 2000, so it was January in 2000. And had choice of going to Minnesota or Florida. So I was like, I'll go to Florida. So you know, I had to go through medical um, detox and all this stuff. And I, it was my introduction to 
AA and like NA and the 12 steps, which is a, was a really important point I'll make later, ties it all back together. Um, and I didn't quite get hold of that, you know, program right at the beginning, but I have a sobriety date of July 9th, 2001. So I've been sober and a 12 step, you know, person. My life has been like reset at the age of 26, mm -hmm. right? Um, and when I got sober, um, I had, I had discovered architecture and I loved architecture, um, but I knew I sucked at it. <laughs> I was working with an architecture firm for a summer in 2001 after working in construction. And just to kind of learn the inner workings of an architecture firm, I planned to go back to school in Columbia. And the firm that I worked for worked in the South Tower of the World Trade Center. So I got my sobriety date July 9th, 2001. 9-11 was about 62 days after that. And I was in the building that day and kind of in, like, escaped by the skin of my teeth with my now current wife, um, who was both, we worked in the same firm together and escaped together, um, but we were just friends at the time. And in the aftermath of that event, I noticed something about my resilience to processing that terrorist event and what I witnessed, what I experienced because I had this place, this 12-step AA program I was able to discuss and talk about that in a very healthy way. Um, and I had peers looking after me in a support system through the 12 step program in AA that really helped me navigate the post traumatic stress of going through that event different than I saw my peers. And my peers who I worked with had, were all on medication, antidepressants, post traumatic stress had kind of really took hold of them mentally. And I felt like I was surrounded by zombies in the workplace. And it was, so I saw the power of this program that brings people together that have a common identity of something or an affliction or something and how they work together to heal themselves collectively. And I came up with the idea of creating a 12 step program for the people that survived that day, including my beautiful wife who's right here. <laughs> I just doing an interview. Um, and we started meeting at sessions and cafes after work and talking about this stuff in a way that I would talk about it with, you know, like, you know, what we experienced that day, what we were feeling. And then we all felt similarly, you know, what we were feeling after the event and what we saw during that event, what was it doing to us mentally, if we were losing sleep at night, if we had fear of being in the subway, but that we weren't alone in that. And that, that kind of collective healing process was really powerful for us. And then in those sessions, my wife and I fell in love. So I, I kind of talk about the journey with my wife, Jennifer, as kind of a love from the ashes. Mm -hmm. She has a background in architecture design, interior design, architecture preservation. And while I was going home and being an architect, she was kind of pushing me to kind of be a real estate developer. Mm -hmm. And um, so she's going to real estate. They, they, I think it was because she saw that they had more, you know, power over how to make transformation happen. Um, and I was reading books about sustainability. I was reading books about all this stuff. So this is kind of the age, my curiosity that I had when I was 13 before I became an addict became and so my new, now new sober adult life came back full force. And I kind of, she gave me a book by James Howard Kunstler called The Geography of Nowhere, The Rise and Decline of the American Man-Made Landscape. And that was like, you know, Ray talks about natural capitalism being his sphere in the heart that led to Interface becoming a global sustainability juggernaut. That book was my sphere in the heart that really woke me to the paradigm, the, I guess, suburban, smaller built environment paradigm I grew up in. So it helped me articulate the patterns that I saw as a teenager and led me on that trajectory, that path until I was 26. So I, I was able to understand the spatial dynamics of suburban sprawl, the commute patterns of fathers, the divorce rate, you know, the lack of sidewalks or walkability, the behavior of teenagers in that society, but lack of having independence from the home or a place for us to kind of, you know, congregate safely outside of the, the you know, the parent world. Um, all these things came rushing into me. So it was kind of my light bulb moment where I was like, oh my God, it helped, it helped me find my purpose and the system that I want to change. Mm -hmm. We're really coming at built environment transformation from a social and ecological transformation perspective. Really, my sweet spot is how do I change the social dynamics of place so that, you know, 
our life journey, we are we are looked after at, at each life stage kind of thing. Um, so then I started working for the the death stars of developers. <laughs> like, so instead of going to Columbia, I went to NYU, got a master's in real estate finance and development. And that was like a really, because I was sober, because I was motivated and I found purpose, I just devoured books. So I read the bibliography of Jane Kunstler's book and read all those books as I was reading and studying all my textbooks in college. So I had this interesting dichotomy of like, here's the system A way of looking at investment risks, you know, real estate investment. You know, this stuff, and I was like, Paul Hawking, Amory Lovins, Hunter Lovins, Chris Alexander, and I was complementing these two mm -hmm. things together, and I was like, wow, I got to create, I got to bridge these two worlds together. So for 20 years, I've been kind of, a, you know, trying to be an architect of change to kind of transition the industry at scale towards these deeper ideals around ecological and social conscious development. So... You know, I was the neophyte coming out of graduate school, working for the big developer in Brooklyn, fighting for the first LEED certified buildings in New York. You know, like, can we just get LEED, not even silver, just get it certified? You know, and, and it was really interesting because it was, um, there wasn't a lot of support systems for change agents back then, right? They were just like, I was a voice in like an ocean of, you know, sharks of developers trying to convince people that just wanted to make a lot of money to change the way they looked at what they were doing as as a as a career and i got made fun of quite a bit this is like 2003 2004 two, early 2000 i got lead certified in 2002 and i was like you know they, they they picked on me and they called me like the green oh you're the green guy but then like 2005 was like a tipping point mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it was like hey remember that you mentioned that thing lead like can you talk to me about that can you can we look at that again? Like all of a sudden it became like a market driver and competitive mm -hmm. advantage. I was like, oh, cool. And that helped me kind of elevate in my, in my role. Um, but I was also kind of looking to get out of New York. Um, I'd been there a long time and grew up around there. And we had a kid at that point and he was really sick. My wife was still dealing with um, the post-traumatic stress of 9-11 and we were looking for greener pastures somewhere and i was like austin texas portland oregon or seattle washington like i want to be in a city that's kind of got lower cost of living that's got the music night food culture going on and i was really between those cities but i chose seattle because i had friends i had some college there but i got a really interesting opportunity to work for paul allen's firm vulcan inc so paul is co-founder of microsoft um, so that was my kind of the beginnings of my journey started in New York where I really started to create stride was in Seattle, right? So I, I consciously said, I want to be in this city because I see like the intellectual capital pool of sustainability is beautiful here. And I can just sponge up all these incredible designers and engineers and thinkers and policy people. Climate, it's, it's already an eco-cultural place. You know, people are wearing Patagonia. They don't want to drive BMWs because you're addicted to drive BMW. You know, it's this different kind of mindset. If you're not doing something sustainable, you don't really matter kind of thing. Um, so the culture of the Northwest is really powerful. Um, and I just jumped in with two feet and I, and I got to, and I had a really interesting sandbox to play in with a billionaire, you know, who had not only this massive real estate portfolio, but, you know, museums, uh, music venues, sports teams, so there's all these different avenues to look at change. Um, and I was a project manager on the Southwest Union, which is an innovation district, but I was kind of pushing, like it was a, when I went from kind of like, you know, still large urban developments in New York, I was dealing with like this huge district now and the scale of change that we could do around energy, water, placemaking, you know, all the different elements of the city and, and getting in the DNA of Seattle to create a really dynamic place. Um, and housing, you know, all the innovative housing models. So I spent like six years there, it was really fruitful for me. But a lot of it had to do with um, spending time with Jonathan Rose, who's my mentor and kind of like, I put him up there with Chris Alexander and a few other people that really profoundly influenced me in the way I see the world and perspectives. Um, Jonathan's a developer in New York, but he's been the pioneer of so much innovation in the world and just a brilliant soul. 
and he was like, I want to be like him, you know, or, you know, and he was like, follow that journey. And part of his work was dealing with climate change. And we had founded an institute in upstate New York, even before I left for Seattle, called the Garrison Institute. And we had a convening in 2005 about real estate in the age of climate change, which had a lot of big, important, influential developers around the country sit down, have this dialogue, like, okay, government's not really going to deal with this. We have an industry have to start taking this on because the group that's in this room, yes, we believe climate change is real. Now we got to start thinking about how do we adapt our portfolios to address climate resilience and change in, the, in, in a changing climate in the future. That morphed into a initiative called Climate and Mind and Behavior and looking at the neuroscience and behavioral dimensions of climate change and being a, you know, a little sponge in the room with all these brilliant neurobiologists, scientists, people like Paul Hawking were there, um, Janine Benyus would be part of those events. Um, this was in like 2006 to 2009, 2010. Um, and I was just reading and learning all this stuff. And one of these was this, this work by Columbia University called the Center for Research and Environmental Decision Making. Mm -hmm. And they have this document they created called the Psychology of Climate Change Communication. It was a very simple, accessible read, but it got into thinking about single action biases, how when we talk and tell the story to create change, we have to speak to both hemispheres of the brain. So the you know, the analytical side, but also the experiential side. So you have storytelling with data, storytelling with data. And I started using that. I was like, wow, this is really interesting. I'm going to start using this as a way to do change agent work in my company. So what was always a really, really a lot of friction in doing change agent work in my companies. I, what I started doing was getting people out of the office. And my, this is my technique that I learned that helped me unlock a whole great, a lot of potential around me. I started taking people out of the office into a coffee shop down the street, one on one, and I would start by making myself vulnerable. Right? You already heard me open up my story when I started. I would, I would, you know, drip a little bit of my personal story into a conversation. Start to identify why this stuff's important to me, and and and, and kind of weave in some data and storytelling, and then that person would make themselves vulnerable, and they start talking about their connection to the issue. And I started articulating a strategy for how to, you know, and then, and then all of a sudden, after so many coffees, <laughs> there was like 40 champions in the company in all the different departments that were taking on ownership of doing change agent work in their department. So it kind of spread this kind of, this model of change within the company that percolated up after a number of years to completely change the executive leadership and the mission of the organization. So it was really great. Um, and around the GFC happened, the, you know, the global financial crisis, um, I just joined the board of, of um, Cascading Rebuilding Council and we had Living Building Challenge put out there and we hadn't started, we hadn't founded the International Living Future until 2010, but 2010 was a really pivotal year. So in the two years leading up to 2010, 2008 to 2010, um, I was tasked with looking at a global change portfolio for Paul because um, the global financial crisis opened up an opportunity which slowed down our work in real estate because we were constrained and I, my boss got permission to use the majority of my time to look at world change stuff. Mm -hmm. And Paul, I wanted to start with what Paul's passion points were, which were science, sports, art, and uh, what's the other one? Science, sports, art. I can't remember the other one. Ah, I'll forget it later, but he had museums, he had cultural institutions, all this stuff. So right around the time we started the International Future Institute, I had the idea of, where I looked across the street from our office and we had this sports stadium and he owned the Seattle Seahawks and the Portland Trailblazers and all these sports things. And I was like, wow, you know, like, that's an interesting place to play. Let me walk across the street and see what those guys are up to. Mm -hmm. And I started talking to them about sustainability initiatives and technologies and things that we can do to green the stadium up. Um, and long story short, we got a $5 million investment after a few months of work to do a massive energy retrofit, put 
a megawatt of solar panels on top of the venue. So it's the largest solar array in Washington state. But you, all of that as a platform to transition mindsets and the culture and behavior of fans around sustainability and what they can take action for in their own home. So we started sharing that stuff with the Seattle Mariners and other sports teams in the region. And in February 2010, I had the idea of convening a dialogue around how do we look at sports as a leverage point to transition society towards sustainability. So we hosted this first session of what became the Green Sports Alliance, um, which is now a, a global nonprofit with every major league sports team in North America as a member. Um, it's about a $2 million organization with a staff of six people. Um, I sit on the executive committee, but it's been like, it was an amazing kind of pawn to play in with the, with the work that you and I do. How do we bring this conversation to, to billions of sports fans? And how do we use iconic sports figures like Messi and Ronaldo to communicate sophisticated ways that kind of shift society in a different directory, trajectory? We're still working on that platform. We're just celebrating 10 years. Next year, we have our conference in Minnesota. Um, so that was one really interesting kind of trajectory. And I, and I started it with like two other people. Once another really important person from the Natural Resource Defense Council, Alan Hershkowitz, I founded the board, chaired it, and I just handed it over to my buddy Scott, who's um, one of the directors of the Mariners, and just a really amazing, you know, quintessential leader of sustainability and sport. And just kind of let it go, you know, it's got to sit back on the board, but then let it grow the way it needed to grow within that industry. Um, and the same thing was happening with the Living Future Institute, and we were kind of really expanding our mission with living buildings around the world. And there's a lot of synergy with the growth that we saw with the sports entity, what we're seeing with how do communities take hold of this deeper level of understanding about sustainable buildings and technologies. Um, so, I mean, Seattle was a really amazing six years for me. Um, and I probably, you know, I got offered to take on an even bigger role, but then I decided to come to Australia. Mm -hmm. Challenge. <laughs> what, what triggered that decision? Like. Um, I wanted to raise my kids out of the U.S. You know, I just feel like from it's from the age of ten, I had this this underlying frustration with America that like maybe I was anachronistic in thinking America was great. Um, maybe I'm an old soul. I just saw something in America that that had lost its way, right? And it just, it, it, and it's, and so the ego, the collective arrogance of America and the ego of America, and, I, and I, if I humanize it, anthropocentrize America, um, and it's very insular, it's very navel-gazing. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want, I want, I have the, you know, great, grateful, grateful, grateful that I have the opportunities to live overseas a bit when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. I, when I was a troubled youth, I had teachers that got scholarships for me and put me in Barcelona for like four months. And it was like, whoa, I love this. Like I, I, I love learning, it's being a, you know, learning another culture, another language, seeing how to live. Um, I, and I, I, became, I, came, I became addicted to that. <laughs> um, and I knew how important it was to develop a level of tolerance to more cultures and countries that we live in to kind of really develop a more worldly view and a worldly mind. So it was really important that my kids were raised a different a different way. I think it's um, it's so important. Like I, I'd been to um, thirty five countries on five continents by the time I, I was twenty nine. I was also a little bit addicted to kind of seeing new places and new cultures, and it it shapes you. And but it also makes you understanding that um, there are different ways of being and yeah. different ways of seeing the world. And it doesn't take that much more than when you've seen that to understand that you just your perspective can only be limited because there's so many others. And I so think, many others. Yeah, and that's, that's like, Tolerance. America so, just doesn't get that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's so many great things about America, and America has so many different personalities. And this is a book, The Six Americas, that's really good. Um, but I just, you know, I, I wanted, um, and I'm lucky that I have a wonderful, wonderful partner, my wife, Jennifer, who's you know, the same adventurous soul as I do. And it's like, you know, we, I took an opportunity and a gamble to come down here and work for an international development organization where I saw, you know, I felt, I felt suffocated in Seattle, mm -hmm. like I, but where I worked, I didn't want to do anything outside of Seattle. I saw all these other opportunities and things happening across the world. I was like, I want to play there and there and there. 
And the idea was that if I worked for a global company, I could take what I was doing in Seattle and expand it internationally. Um, that wasn't the case though. <laughs> um, very tough doing it in a corporate shareholder organization. Um, but six years I've been here, I've not been on the same trajectory that I had in Seattle, the impact I had with the government and climate movement, White House stuff we were doing on climate change policy. Like I just didn't, couldn't connect with the company that I was in, I was kind of stuck in this little role. Um, but what grounds me, and it's and it's it's somewhat frustrating. When I moved down here, I felt like I stepped back ten years in, in time with regards to sustainability. Like the stuff they're thinking through now is stuff that we did in the early two thousands or late two thousand tens with policy around climate resilience, adaptation, energy efficiency, all this stuff that's that's still taking hold now here. Um, and probably 30 years behind. I love, the other thing I do is work on social equity issues and housing issues, so we're probably 30 years behind in that regard. Mm. Um, but regardless of the frustration I have from an industry perspective and what I do here and what I practice here, why I'm super grounded here is because of the First Nations perspective, so the Aboriginal perspective. Um, and a lot of my thinking, even when I was a teenager, and the stuff I was doing in New York was influenced by a lot of First, being, I was very drawn to First Nation culture mm -hmm. and ideology. And, you know, it's expressed in movies and everything else, but there was something deeper that I was always trying to chase, even when I was trying to engage with tribes in the Northwest. And I saw how regenerative development was so heavily influenced by that. And Bill Reed from the Genesis became a really good mentor for me in like 2008. So I've been, you know, balancing things off him and working with him for a long time. And book sharing, sharing knowledge. And, and, and it, it's always kind of like, oh, oh, that's interesting. And Carol Sanford, who runs that regenerative business world, she lived down the street from me in Seattle. She was who I worked with a bit on the, on the Vulcan stuff. You know, these are all the people that were influencing me. Plenty Fisk in Austin, Texas, Lucia Athens, Paul, Amory. You know, when I read their books, I wanted to meet them and become part of the world and just, you know, and be, uh, respectfully be a next generation custodian of their work. And like we carry forward, David Suzuki, you know. When we had the Living Future Institute, it was great because we could host all these people, you know, we bring all these amazing leaders around the world. Who, who, um, who funded the setting up of the Living Futures Institute? Uh, sponsorship, the Candida Fund, Summit Foundation, um, JPB Foundation. Um, we had really good initiatives that were sponsorable. I helped raise a lot of money when I was there on the board. We had membership. Um, so we had, they had an operating budget of like four million bucks. Um, so from and revenue from a, a number of different things. Living Building Challenge was a big one. And, and the Living Future Unconference was a big revenue generator. Mm -hmm. So that was, it was a good, and I did a lot of work with J Jason and I still work together. So it's a great family of practitioners that, that kind of came out of that, that generation from, two, from 2008 to 2015 and continues. Um, so the work I'm doing now in kind of expanding the field, there's a lot of credit goes to Carolyn Robinson who you saw in the video when we were in London, right? She's just an amazing person. So she connected to Regenesis and kind of brought it into Auckland. And for five years, it's kind of really been taking hold of creating a nodal transformation center in, in Auckland, in New Zealand, which is really powerful platform, not just for them, but for Pamela and Bill and Ben and Joel at Regenesis because of the Maori influence and how things go in New Zealand. Mm. Um, so when you do a retreat and training there, you're on a marae, you're with the Maori, you're learning Maori ideology, language. It's, it's a very interesting cultural immersion process that happens. Um, and when they all knew, I knew Bill, and was bringing Bill down to do talks and engagement, like we all just connected up. And we're, there's, there's a really great, um, there's probably 150 people that have gone through training now over the last five years in Australia and New Zealand. And we're like a, a family of practitioners, but we're, this is what Dom would be interested to talk to if she's on the call right now. What I see is that they go through this kind of mental model training with their genesis for that kind of three month training and then they kind of get dropped off and they're like, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. So there's 
what I've had to do in my career, my trajectory is take the ideals of regenerative development and figure out how to apply them through a broken system, right? The banking system, the finance system, the valuation system, the project management of it, like how to actually make a living building work at scale. Um, and that led me in a lot of different directions, but you know, I have a, 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 de a delivery framework that I've had to cultivate over the last 10 years on how to manage and deliver regenerative developments for reduce risk, cost, added value, sell it, get it through the planning, approval process, all that stuff. So we're looking at doing a, a training sessions now to help practitioners here, particularly ones that have signed up for the Architects Declare movement, mm -hmm. to really further their skill sets and understanding the role and how to manage and execute on this, this stuff. It's one thing to understand the what, it's really the how that we're, we're missing in the, in, the, in the movement here in the industry. Um, but I'm not doing that with just my perspective. My business partner is Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. And as I'm always the curious learner and analogist, as you heard me start my conversation, I've learned more in the last three years from my Aboriginal brothers and sisters than I have in the previous, you know, 17 years of my journey. Mm, wow. I'm also understanding uniquely the way that Westerners have kind of colonized First Nations practices around the world, called it something else, and use it for their own financial benefit. Mm. Like biophilia or like permaculture. Mm. <laughs> you know, things that we use in our world. I was blind to the fact where that where those practices were influenced by. You know, Phil Mollison seeing how Aboriginal people had mosaic fire regimes and how they managed their food and agriculture and the complex system of society and management and percentage of land. Um, so what I'm doing now, we're, I'm starting a, um, so my business partner is Chels Marshall. And Chels, I, my wife knows I'm like super passionate about First Nations culture and ancient civilization for that. So Chels was doing a talk at the Australian Museum maybe three years ago. And I, I was like, oh my God, that's the person I need to connect with. The same people I was trying to chase in the US. And she was like, the connection to that world that I needed. And I you know, stalked her a bit at the talk and we had a conversation, we had a coffee. I invited her in um, to a project and we were, we were having a coffee in Canberra and she didn't know who I was, but, but, but the way that you and I have cultivated our minds from living around the world and absorbing this, this way of thinking about the world from a regenerative perspective, I was able to connect with her as a white person more than anyone else has in the past. And she cried in my arms for like, we're crying. <laughs> and we cried because I saw, um, we just had this really powerful moment and we've been like best friends for like three years. Like I'm mentoring her, her on regenerative development. She's been mentoring me in Aboriginal knowledge, but you know, I have to earn the right to accrue that knowledge in, the, in that world. So after two years now, I'm invited up now to meet the elders and, and see different parts of country and learn different practices and knowledge. And she's always helping me understand how what she's learned from her ancestors and her parents and how she was raised aligns with biophilia and biomimicry and regenerative practice. And we call it that because that's the Western construct that we had to create. Um, so we've developed this platform called cultural reciprocity, right? So it merges my journey with her journey and the knowledge fusion of Western science, Aboriginal knowledge systems and traditional practices and advanced community making. So we're trying to wow. build a bridge between cultures. And um, we, over the summer, we're planning to start a school called the Gumbanger School for Life Center Design. So she's a Gumbanger nation. She's a Gumbanger woman. And her background is, you know, super intact knowledge transfer from her lineage going back thousands of years. Her totem is the, is the sea. Her people's totem is the ocean. So they're very marine focused. So she's a systems ecologist and a marine biologist and an Aboriginal ecologist. Mm. So she is the perfect blend of these different worldviews. Um, so she's got the storytelling and the scientific data. <laughs> you know, she's really powerful. I, really, like I had this moment, um, what, what you're just sharing is, is, is really touching me because I think one of the most beautiful moments for me this year has been 
um, on the last day of the meeting where we met in the Commonwealth Secretariat, um, back at the hotel, I somehow got into a conversation with Johnny Freelander from, from New Zealand. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and we had this brief mind melt where, where we had this, op like I had this opportunity to just test out some of the key frameworks that inform my way of thinking and my, my practice. And then he would immediately sort of pick it up and say, yes, in our people understand this in a different, like, like he would create the mirror piece of what my Western mind framework in terms of scale linking design and nested wholeness and, and, and interconnectedness or, or this, this hunch that there's something wrong with our understanding of time, that, that the past, the, the future and the present are actually co-present and that the only place where you can ever do anything is in the moment now, but it is connected in both ways to the past and the future, and that, that we are repatterning the future in the present. And so I would come up with these frame, like share these frameworks with him, and then he would mirror them back to me from deep um, Maori knowledge. And, and I never felt so corroborated that something like, probably in a limited understanding, but that I at least was on some kind of, path of understanding so I'm, I'm, I'm amazed with decolonizing our minds right yeah. so there's this process of unlearning mm -hmm. the way that we were educated and grew up in a western context and ideology and epistemology um, that at 44 years old I'm unlearning more in the last few years than I have in my previous one. it's like it's amazing um, and it's, it's just it's a very powerful platform mm -hmm. so if over the summer we're trying to create this online school around life-centered design um, that fuges this indigenous knowledge and Western thinking, but it would be pairing up like you with Johnny and having you know, an online, you know, an hour discussion between how you talk about this and, you know, and let Johnny talk about from our perspective. And then tapping into the marine side of that, the land, the food system, that's like a whole different way to tell the story with two different worldviews that, but then that's yeah. such important work i mean you, you said earlier that you were a bridge builder in back in that world of, of, um kind of the green world and the construction world and but this bridge building of of deep rooted indigenous knowledge into the the western world in a in a meeting each other at eye height or even in, even getting arrogant westerners to um connect with humility to a point to understand that what, what we've lost in our obsession with technology and science and um, the, the kind of where systems thinking, as Johnny calls it, um, it, we we disconnected with the knowledge of how to live in place over 10,000 years in a way that um, we are gardeners that we are keystone species that help that place flourish and unfold its potential as part of that place and we call that wisdom primitive and so the, what i'm hearing that what you what you're building is, is i think probably the most important bridge that we need to build to reconnect agreed what actually made us survive for ten thousands of years as a species well, it's at least 80,000 here. And the other thing is that's so great is that it's the longest pan-continental peace period of any race of humanity in history. Wow. The complexity of that society and how the advance, we saw only primitive with our Western eyes when we came here, or whoever came here. But yeah, this, we're only hitting the tip of the iceberg. And Dom is rooted right in this. Hi, Dom. Hi, hi. Um, hey. Really nice to meet you. We're just, yeah. uh, Devin, we're, we're, by the way, we're recording this. Hi. Sorry, I'm late. Sorry, I'm late. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of an echo with your with your computer. Say, say something again. Sorry, I, I was just saying sorry, I was late. Ah, no problem at all. Uh, it's just my headphones. Um, so there's no, there shouldn't be an echo. Yeah, I think it's getting... Sorry, um, I might turn off my video. Okay. There's so a bit of a delay. Is that, in, is that better? It's yeah. better. Yeah. When I first yeah. arrived in Australia, Bill introduced me to Dom. So Dom's been a friend and kind of, she, she's really been one of the pioneer that's really created the fertile ground for regenerative 
even discussion around it in the vernacular of the industry here. Um, and doing that as an academic and as a practitioner has a really exciting role. So Dom's been a force of change down here in both New Zealand and she was with me when we did all the stuff in New Zealand as well. Well, it's, it's really nice to meet you, um, Dom. I've, we've, we've only been in, in contact by email a couple of times. So um, like Jason and I just dove into this as a little interview that I'm hoping to share as a blog. And um, so I, I hope you're okay with that. Um, yeah, that's fine. That's great. Maybe, maybe now that, that you joined us, I'll, um, I'll give, you, give you a brief opportunity to uh, share a little bit how you have been working with regeneration in Australia and, and, and help to kind of what, what Jason just said, help to kind of create the foundations for Australia and New Zealand seems seem to be the yep. hot of regeneration at, at the moment on the planet. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's, um, yeah. So um, I just want to actually respond to your previous conversation because I've been listening in for about 10 minutes while I was trying to get my technology going. But um, as Jason knows, I've been working on this idea of modern custodianship, mm -hmm. which isn't just about respecting their past knowledge, mm -hmm. even, you know, their past knowledge, which is still current. So it's, it's a difficult one to speak to, but their knowledge. But to also say, well, when that knowledge is applied to current issues, here is the innovation that is occurring. So um, uh, Jason and I have got a colleague who's looking at in, um, artificial intelligence. So what if we design the algorithms instead of being linear uh, in a um, indigenous circular expansive way? What would the difference be? How would the world look differently? And, and so there's some really interesting stuff in that yes and conversation between uh, indigenous wisdom and knowledge and thinking and being and the current issues and thinking and being and it's not about privileging either it's actually about coming together and, and seeing what emerges so um, that sort of I'm really interested in supporting however that emerges in the world um, as for my role in regenerative development in this part of the world I see myself as mycelium mm -hmm. so something that's become more and more apparent to me is that I'm not really a front person. Um, what I like to do is connect people, pass on messages, um, uh, hear what people are saying, see their potential, and then connect them into systems where that potential can contribute. Um, I think, Jason, you know, you've seen me work, and I think that's where I'm at my best. Mm. Um, and um, and so, you know, um, Daniel, um, that's why, you know, when I was seeing everything happening out of Europe, I wanted to make sure you were connected into it. Um, and I'm glad that you were, but it's that, that's kind of my space. I am the mycelium maybe of the regenerative development network, or I was, um, it seems to have really, really grown a lot stronger. Um, and, um, and so it, it's gained its own momentum, um, which is wonderful. Yeah. And, and, and have you managed both in Australia and New Zealand to, to cultivate ongoing connections between the people who've gone through the regenerative practitioner training and, and have that shared background and those shared frameworks? Or um, after the course of people just go on and, and try to uh, um, work on how to make those frameworks actually work in their, their daily practice alone? Both. Uh, both. Um, yeah. So there's a bunch of us that are all still connected and support each other. Uh, there are a bunch of people that have added it to their concept of who they are in the world. Mm -hmm. So for me, the, the TRP, the Regenesis work, came together with the Colorado Lenses work, came together with my placemaking work, came together with um, you know, uh, the just trying to build capacity in the world to be contributive. So all of those things came together. And so um, it isn't about purity to one idea. It's about taking from that what supports me in my practice and makes me feel like I'm contributing. But I would say, Jason, and you might uh, be able to add to this as well, that we're mostly all connected um, in as much as we can be. But then also, you know, Jason's doing amazing work um, with, our shells and and working at that big end of town and actually cutting through um, because of his wonderful accent and experience 
uh, in in America, people sit up and listen. <laughs> I wish I hadn't have lost my I Dutch accent. <laughs> <laughs> Are you so you're originally Dutch, Dominic? I didn't, didn't know that. Yes, 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 I'm Dutch. But I, I grew up in Brazil and South Africa, so uh, I have another. Uh, point, we were talking earlier about how important it actually is to have experience, lived experience of different cultural contexts to be able to, to do this kind of work. And so, um, yet again, yeah. a corroboration of that. <laughs> Um, indeed, indeed. And, and I think the other critical thing is to have that life moment where um, it's like the initiation ceremony of going from a, an, a child into an adult where um, you realise that you, you make a choice, you know, you make a choice to become a contributive part of the system. I yeah. think that's another really important aspect of, of this work. I think you're, you're speaking to something that, because Jason also shared his personal story um, earlier, that this, the fact that the world is in such a mess is partially to do with the fact that we are being governed by uninitiated teenagers, no matter what age they are. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's really one of the big connections to um, First Nations or Indigenous cultures is that that moment in life where as a teenager, you're invited into a rite of passage that makes you cross that threshold into mature membership in your community and of course understanding community not just as the human community but the, the wider community of life that that's really what's so fundamentally missing in our culture and what I feel yes, but, but, just briefly sorry, what, what I feel is that that the current climate crisis and the unraveling of, of ecosystems, the, the cascading ecosystems collapse around the world, is somehow creating conditions that at species level um, that are similar to a rite of passage because it is making us face death at the higher level and yeah. that is making us reflect on why are we here, what's, why is this worth it and what is our role and who are we obliged to, all the questions that rite of passage rituals kind of yep. spark in people. And, and, and my big hope, and actually my, my only hope, is that, that, that we will get that shift of personal development, consciousness shift through this crisis and, and mature quickly to actually become healers um, and, and avoid the civilizational collapse that now so many people are speaking about. Um, mm. And at the same time also gain the maturity in that process that we aren't quite yeah. so to going on anymore. Um, because I think that's a part of it, to, to be able to let go to your own, like, like to embrace your own mortality and that things are finite, are finite and then live from, from a place that, that is actually about really connecting in the moment and, and caring for the relationship that we can have while we're here. So um, a few thoughts and, and jump in anytime, um, Jason. Um, have you spoken to Charles Eisenstein? Well, I, I know I've known Charles for for a few years, but I, I, we've never really had very deep one-on-one -on -one conversations yet. Um, haven't had yeah, because time. because this 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 discussion around um, you know the maturation process and the initiation ceremony and the permission to become an adult and contribute as an adult is very much around his thinking. But that's um, I tell you where that comes from. That's because we have a shared mentor. Um, he he's he's very closely linked with Gigi Coyle um, from the School of Lost Borders in in California, and and that's where I got th that deeper understanding from having done my vision quest with them. And Gigi in, um, has been mentoring Charles a lot. Char Charles, the one thing that I have a bit, bit of a gripe with Charles about is that he. Um, doesn't honor lineage very much in terms of his communications. I think, um, like, I think he believes that ideas come out of the collective con consciousness, so they're everyone's, which is fine. I can, I can underwrite that, but at the same time, um, naming your, your mentors and naming your elders and naming your sources helps other people to find those streams up, like, like to, to travel upstream and, and that, I, I and and it, uh, and it honors and it honors their gifts to you yeah. Yeah. as as a as a learning um yeah so that that was my first thought um my second thought is that 
I don't necessarily believe that our First Nations people had it completely right because they were still fragile, mm. right? So we came in and, and disrupted this system. Mm. So it, it's as much as for them to learn as for us to learn and then to move together mm. is, is really how I, how I see things. Yes, they, they had connection to place. Yes, they had those initiation ceremonies. Yes, they had respect. They were part of, as you said, the garden and tending the future. But they were still fragile, and, and particularly within the number of people in the world at the moment, um, we need to find a different solution or a different way together that uses that past wisdom, current knowledge, and our current situation and context to move forward. Um, and so that's why I talk about, you know, it's, it's not about privileging either system or, you know, there's East and Western and Indigenous. So there's, there's lots of different ways, but it's about yes and conversation. Not, the, the, and the, and that, that, that's difficult because there is so much history. The framing that I like a lot, um, I, like with, with regard to this is, um, I don't know if you've ever come across this small little book by Owen Barfield called um, Saving Appearances. Um, in that book, he makes the point that, like, he, he speaks of original participation and then the separation of the Enlightenment and the kind of disappearing into our mind and, and science and technology. And then he speaks of final participation as the coming together of those, those two. So it, it, it is a movement forward um, that recovers the wisdom of the past, but, but it, it combines it with, with the wisdom of science and technology um, as well. Um, so, so I... I'm, that's amazing. Could you mention that, that book and author again? Um, Owen Barfield, Saving Appearances. He's, he was an yep. Oxford University scholar who, who has been very influential in the anthroposophical world. Um, he's, he's kind of part of that world. But I, I would just, just briefly going back to something you said earlier with AI um, and bringing ind indigenous ways of thinking together with those kind of technologies. I, I do sometimes wonder whether part of the the wisdom of indigenous cultures is to also choose wisely what technologies are actually worth using. Like, uh, like I feel like we have a tendency to use technology because we can. Like somebody comes up with, oh, we could create this technology. And then somebody else says, oh, we could use it for that. And, and mainly most of our technologies have really been developed within a context of trying to kill each other and the, the military development complex. But I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that we, that we end up using technology too much and at, at, like the kind of bits and bytes type of technology instead of coming back to the social technologies that, the, that um, we could live a much richer and more meaningful life with, um, with, with less technology in our lives. What do you think about that? Yeah. Both of you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm a big fan of less technology. I was on a panel with for the World Wildlife Foundation a few months ago, and it was with me and like Schneider Electric and all the digital people that are looking at smart homes of the future and how technology is going to make our lives so much better. And I, I was the you know the divergent voice on the panel, like I don't know, like my kids are on their phone all the time. We're trying to deal with new like parental management techniques so it's at the new age for parenting kids and technology technology age what does it mean to their social skills if they're everything's on here mm -hmm. um so there is there needs to be a cautious way we move forward with the application and adoption of technology in our culture and i'm a big fan of like no phone holidays you know and like mm -hmm. you know getting back to basics and face-to-face -face contact and meetings and Although we're using this platform right now to get engaged face to face, yeah, which is what? Um, but I, I've also, since I've been indoctrinated to Aboriginal culture here with my, my brothers and sisters, it's my understanding of technology has changed. I'm thinking about technologies that was developed by them 30,000 years ago, mm -hmm. and we have a very contemporary way to articulate this with the issues we're having with the bushfires, mm -hmm. right? And we had when you had Aboriginal occupation of the country, the majority of nations use a seven season calendar. And they had a national scale fire, you know, 
slapstick regime of managing the landscape, not only for prevention of out of control fires from lightning or other sources, but also stewardship of life and species and plants and undergrowth and understory and food for the mammals and other you know things. So they they did this cool mosaic burn strategy and everyone participated in it by keeping everything below a meter so it keeps it out of the ground. And they did it in a way they knew where the animals would be able to move safely out of the way of fire and never be endangered. And that at a national scale. And it also did the cultivation with allowing the ashes to um, you know, let the seeds pop for the t tumors that were there, or tubers that they were growing, something like that. It's brilliant, brilliant stuff. And Western, I think some Western, I think some contemporary Australian, like Royal Fire Service, tried to adopt some of that stuff. But we wouldn't be, being, if we had that learnings and cultural reciprocity mm. of using an Aboriginal approach to doing it with Western approaches. We probably wouldn't be in the situation right. So when I called, I was at Rec Bay Land Council down in South New South Wales on Monday. Who are you know very strong Aboriginal land council, own their own land, have their own governance. They're almost they're one of like the four precedent councils that have a sovereignty in the Commonwealth with Uluru and a couple others. And I called them up and said, "How are you doing with the fires?" Like, "Oh yeah, we we did our burns two years ago. We're totally fine." Mm -hmm. If they because of the seven, seven season cycle, they knew how to manage this. And there was a, the politics of fire regimes with different nations and clans was really managed. And we come down and copy paste it a four seasons calendar around food, growth, land management, all those things. And you see the repercussions. Well, it's not just that we copy and pasted a, a four season calendar, but it's a four season calendar based on something arbitrary. Yeah. Um, you know, and not that the moon is, arbitrary so much but um but you know whereas a look at signs within nature so you know some years summer might be shorter and some years summer might be longer it depends on when a certain thing happens in that environment that switches the season not a, a, a date mm -hmm. uh, and i and i think that's the, the great wisdom of it in that it's a, a a set of rules that allows you to act in response to what's happening in a place in response to the climate. Yeah, I, I remember in 2000... Sorry, Jason, I interrupted. No, no, it's fine. It's perfect. It was, you didn't interrupt. You added yes <laughs> and. <laughs> in, in 2000 and... When was it? 2009, I um, helped to bring Bioneers to Europe, um, two conferences, one in, in Zeist in Holland and, and one in, um, in New Zealand, uh, in, 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 in Findhorn. And... Um, I had the opportunity to meet a guy called Dennis Martinez, um, who is part of the First Nations in, in, in the U US who um, work a lot with traditional ecological knowledge of uh, indigenous American tribes. And their fire regime in California really kept the, like it's, it's, yet an, it's an, another example of not following the fire regime practices of First Nations people in California as, as created the conditions um, apart from bad upkeep of electrical lines by the power companies to, to create the fires in in, um, in California um, it's yeah we how do we now that we are approaching eight billion people on the planet how do we value those cu cultural inputs and then square it up with the fact that there's a lot more people with us like on the planet now and we have a much more brittle system because we've we've degraded ecosystems all over the place um, drastically well I, I i think it's partly the 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 yes and and moving together conversation it is some sort of technological in, input as well um but it is as you said that wise choosing of those technologies um, and I, I don't necessarily think that the degradation that we've created is irreversible. I think it's a mind shift. Uh, and that's what regenerative development is all about. If, if we, you know, put on, put on our big girl and big boy pants and, uh, and say, what can I do? You know, all, all eight billion of us turn around and say, what can I do to support uh, a thriving place? Mm things will change very quickly. 
uh, and it, and it's creating those narratives and those examples and that, that understanding. And I was just saying to someone today, I've, I've done four major building projects over the last 20 years. 20 years ago, I had to fight to get a water tank in, rainwater tank in. Today, we're talking about, um, you know, they're discussing the merits of the living building challenge and how it's not pushing them hard enough. <laughs> And, and, you know, these, these are multi-million dollar huge organisations who are, now have the language of biophilia, biomimicry, connection, contribution, bringing in social enterprise, all these sorts of things. So there is a consciousness emerging. Um, and um, Chris Duplessis uh, talked about, you know, the innovation curve and that at some point that innovation curve kicks on, kicks up from the early adopters into mainstream and that we're actually getting quite close to that within the concepts of, um, and, and it, is, it is the people holding on very fiercely to old ways that is, is stopping the full emergence of this. Um, but I'm, I'm actually quite hopeful um, around our ability to actually contribute um, to future thriving. Yes, our population number is a huge issue, but you know, somebody said, you know, you, you've got to have a, you've got to have a stand on population. I said, look, I've got a friend with five kids, and the fifth kid is going to be the kid that changes the world, just like Beethoven was, you know, or was it Mozart was the ninth kid of of a um, shady lady, um, who then, you know, turned the world the world of music around. It, it's very difficult to make rules around these sorts of things. Yeah, it's and about I the narratives that people carry with them. No, I, I have a concern actually about because I, I hear a lot of people coming back to the overpopulation issue, and um, and I actually think that it's a dangerous meme in the sense that yes, over time, over a century, it would probably be wise to slow to to, to bring populations numbers down. Um, but I think that that's a natural process. Like we already have the data that shows us as soon as you educate women, um, the, the 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 number of kids and families do naturally go down um, all over the world and, and that most, most likely um, the human population will start dipping in the second half of the century, even if we dis discard horrible catastrophes. But, but it, I think that there's a sort of right-wing conversation happening at the moment that, that is almost preparing people for justifying some kind of larger um, wars uh, to reduce population numbers that is really dangerous. Um, I, I completely agree with you. We have the potential to become healers in place, all of us, and then it's actually a benefit that there's that many of us. Um, and and we, we, we can create shared abundance for all of humanity. We, we, we... That's the new localism, mm. you know, that I'm sure that Helen was talking about in her book. But that, for me, that's, that, that, that's a good point because like when, when I hear it's on one. It's wonderful to be working with these large real estate developers, and, and but but to what extent are we still like so many of the drivers of our current economic and monetary system are degenerative? It's structurally driving people to compete with each other and 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 exploit nature. And when we Ab absolutely, absolutely, I'm not saying that it's the right model. I'm just seeing I'm sh seeing a shift in conversation at all levels. Yeah, no, no. Um, that, I, I, it, it, the patterns are moving in the right direction for me. Like I, I look past the Trumps and the Borises and the other neoliberalist movements and what happened here. That's just kind of blips. It is those with power, grasp of desperation to hold on to that without or fearful of changing. But I see the the reaction and the consciousness shifting happening in a response to that. You have this democratic socialist movement on the rise across the UK and across the US, empowerment of you know, less advantaged citizen groups happening, all this movement, this, this blessed unrest that Paul would have called out years ago in his book, is really galvanizing the global movement, the climate activism of the next generation, with Greta. Yeah. I mean, that's a new dimension at scale across the world that you see is, is this global shift of human consciousness. Mm. But we have to we have to protect our. Um, that's one of the things I'm worried about. This whole young movement around climate change um, isn't supported with the regenerative narrative of, um, you know, just just like Pamela Mang and, and those guys say you might see potential at a hundred, um, and it might come out at twenty, 
um, it's still much better than if you hadn't been involved. But often these, uh, the idealism of young and wanting to make a difference means that they get burnt out because they can't see the impact of the little things that might end up being a no, but in 10 years time may turn into a yes. And um, it really worries me that we're not supporting these movements with some of that, yeah. that thinking that we have all been working on. I think that's the big challenge for the next, like in terms of the urgency of, of, of the fierce urgency of now with climate change now, like it's really the challenge of the next year or two to make that connection of this, like 2019 was the year of Greta and um, Extinction Rebellion um, waking a whole, like a massively larger percentage of the global population up to the urgency to act on climate change. But it has been a message of, I want you to panic, extinction is near, that kind of um, yeah. near, uh, urgency driven. And, and what, what is it, on, on the one hand, that's activating to some extent, but um, it, it is also like if we don't connect that, and particularly the young people of Fridays for Future movement, to the deeper practices that some pioneers that, that um, Jason and I were mentioning earlier, like like Emery Lovins and, and Paul Hawkins, or, or my mentor, John Todd, who I uh, um, did my PhD with, um, David, David Orr, <laughs> um, Permaculture Movement, and, and, and Bill Mollison and all these guys, they, they, they are, we know a lot of ways how to heal landscapes. And, and what, if the discourse of Greta would shift towards regeneration is possible, we can heal the planet, and we actually know how to. Um, then to bring all these young people into new types of education systems that, that because our universities are desperately mm -hmm. obsolete in the way that they yes, I've just given up. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and basically, like I was just talking to, to um, somebody yesterday about this, this need, John Macy's framing of that we need to be hospice workers to an old system and midwives to a new. Um, right now, all these yeah. movements just look at what's dying, um, the, the, the old system, but we're not having enough people in the streets talking t for that future of us being healers of the planet again and in that process healing ourselves. And uh, so, so I think that's, that's a key shift that we have to make in the next 24 months. Yep. Been what I've been trying to do since 2009, mm. create those alternate narratives of, that show us the, the way after the disruption. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we used to get in this dialogue with, uh, with Al Gore in the early days of the Climate Reality Project because it was this very, you would do his presentation, but it was very dystopian with something like catacly you know, cataclysmic future. And it was, we, we had talked about the hope bucket. You got to find the opportunity, the opportunistic future. And where's the hope in that message? Yeah. So it's showing we all on the ground work that's happening and carrying that hope bucket the whole time. Have, really important. Have you both connected to this um, project that was just got launched last week, um, Countdown? Have you heard of it? Mm -mm. No. Countdown is, is a partnership um, between future stewards, um, TED and YouTube, Hello. and it's Hello. it's a process that is trying to basically drive. The, going. Um, it's a process to drive the, the the turn towards basically zero emissions by 2050 um, across all sectors, uh, using getting to mainstream through channels like TED and and YouTube, and but really focusing on solutions, focusing on what we can do. And um, I think it'd be really interesting uh, to connect both of you into that that world. And because, because Jason mentioned Al Gore, um, Al Gore at, at the launch of um, Countdown um, mentioned that some system psychologists quote, that things always take longer than you think, but then they also happen much faster than you ever thought they uh, would be possible. Yeah. And I think we're just at that point where it feels yeah. frustrating for people like us who've been working on this for, for 20 years, um, the, how little has shifted. And some of our mentors have been working on it for 40 years. Um, but I think we're, we're at the cusp of seeing rapid shift happening. But it is connecting solutions to 
the, the people who are now on the barricade saying we need to act. Yeah. Yep. So I, I, I need to go um, put children to bed and all of that sort of thing. Um, okay. uh, what's next? Well, it was wonderful to just just have this opportunity to to connect. Maybe we'll we'll, we'll do it um, some other time to explore. And I'll be on time. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I'll I'll just send you an email and um, wrap up with, with with Jason just now, and and then we'll we'll see what, when we have a conversation. Maybe in, does January look good for you for another conversation towards the end of January? Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Yep. Um, we're on holidays from the 18th to the 25th, but I okay. decided that's fine. Good. Wonderful. Really nice to see you. Yeah. And thanks for showing up, even if it was late, but it's, it's just nice to make that first connection. Um, yeah. It, um, it is. I feel like I know you, but I, I don't actually. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Yes. Um, you still owe me a coffee. <laughs> I do owe you a coffee. <laughs> And, and, a, and, a, um, and a blues jazz night. Oh, that's good. We do. Uh, well, I'm coming down to teach a regenerative uh, like a development course for GBCA in February. So I'll let you know when I'm down there. Yeah. Cool. Great. See ya. Cool. Right. See ya. Right. So, um, that was interesting interlude in our <laughs> conversation. Oh, this is the interlude. Yeah, it sounds great. Um, you, you, yeah, you do pick up on the there's like complementary skill sets needed. It's the collective intelligence or network performance that's really important in shaping this movement. Mm -hmm. It can't be one person's view. Like Dom and I work really together because she has this very academic way of, of coming at it and I have a practitioner way and like, mm -hmm. we've had a couple of clients together where we work and fuse those together and it works really, really well. And but, should... what, what's your experience? Because one thing that I'm, I'm sort of having been in the um, kind of intentional community eco-village movement, um, like I've spent good time sitting in circles trying to make consensus decisions and, and getting everybody's voice heard. And, and I know how slow that can also be. Um, and luckily the, the new more agile methods like sociocracy um, make that process a lot easier, but I still looking at things like what's happening in the, in, Every time on, on the globe now, where there is some form of um, uh, public vote to a large group of people voting on an issue, the surprise seems to be that people vote the wrong way. <laughs> like they vote, vote towards for the demagogue, vote for the people who are playing the media and misinforming them and end up like, I mean, what just happened in the, in the UK is another example of, of um, like clear analysis that Labour didn't lie once in, in any of their um, campaign slogans and, and that the Conservatives were 80% were of them were misleading, but, but it seems to be successful. What, what, what I'm trying to get at is having had an education system that alienated us from each other and from the natural world for so long and having been manipulated by um, mass media into being uh, busy consumers and wanting things that are really not that meaningful um, and, and don't really fulfill us. When you, when you then turn into this really participatory community, having all the voices heard, accessing collective intelligence space, you do get these voices that are just basically repeating the brainwashing of the old system. Yeah, I think, well, I think the, so I, I mean, I've always had to use the frame, like I'm the sheep in wolf's clothing, not the other way around. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I've, I've had to, you know, be in that corporate world and, and sell this stuff. Um, and I think what I see is the, either the Democratic Party or the Labour Party in Australia, the UK, what happened in the US. Either they take it, they try, it's almost like they try to solve everything in one campaign platform. Mm -hmm. And it's so different than what's currently under the liberal regime that scares the shit out of people, even just like the everyday. We were talking about this afternoon, like, how the fuck did the Liberal Party 
get the working class behind them. Mm. You know, the Labour Party was for the working class. It's like, yeah. it's nuts that you have like truck drivers in America voting for Trump, but it was like, they're scared shitless of change. Mm. Right? So I think there's, there's got to be a new approach to this and not so radical. It's got to be the journey. You got to start with the acorn and mm. let that movement grow to an oak tree over time. But you got to, they got to show it like the, the Labour Party should have automatically won the election here, mm. right? If they just didn't say fucking anything, they probably would have won. But they went in and started talking about all these tax changes and all these radical changes, which just scared everyday people that are stuck in the system that was created by the Liberal Party. You know, it's like mm. it, it, they're nervous about that change. So I think there's got to be a different way. Of, I mean, my, my whole strategy session today was like, how do we find the right labor candidate that really understands community wealth building in a way to talk about this stuff and frame it in a way that brings the, that, that unifies the parties a different way to talk about this stuff um and i i mean the uk has got so much great momentum happening on uh, cooperative economy happening and, and stuff like that at the local level and almost at a certain point isn't really mattering what the federal governments are doing because the local, the cities are making major changes and local mm -hmm. municipalities are adopting some really great stuff. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a tough one, man. It's a, it's a really tough one. But it's, it's the narrative and how we sell it. And it's, we gotta be as smart as the wolves are. You know, like, is the Republican regime or the Liberal Party regime that's just fucking brilliant at their tactics mm. you know they're ruthless at those tactics and we have to be equally you know smart about how to do that um the one thing i forgot though on the governance side is tying it back to aa so like we also have carol sanford running a cab program down here so people that have graduated from trp we have them in this ongoing quarterly engagement there's 40 people now under new zealand and australia meeting up with carol online Are this every quarter in, uh, down under CAD program specific for people in yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I started that with Caroline uh, uh -huh. Robinson. Dominic's part of it. Um, and then we're also doing what I'm doing this learning journey for regenerative practitioners is kind of okay, you graduate from TRP. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the mental model a bit more, but let's bring in an Aboriginal, you know, culture. Let's talk about the integrated design process, the project management techniques for delivering and executing on living buildings that are you know, the low cost, it's, it's this whole platform I've created for the last 10 years. Um, we're looking at hosting the Regenesis training. I have a call with Pamela and Joel next month with Chells to do it on country and actually start to bring Chells and other Aboriginal elders into the teaching. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of knowledge transfer between Regenesis and Aboriginal Australians. So we can actually look at a much more place-based understanding of regenerative development that's been here 80,000 years. Because mm. that, uh, that, kind of, that was the, the, the conversation with Johnny Freelander that, that I found so fascinating um, in October also seemed to suggest that what, what happened for him when he met Regenesis and the, the frameworks of regenerative development was that he recognized that he was a, a voicing of indigenous wisdom in a Western language that yeah. actually could build the foundations of one side of the bridge um and 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 so he like he, he was talking a lot about this framing i think he'd just done a master's on this um of of comparing square systems thinking of of western modernized people with the, the circular systems thinking of um indigenous cultures and how how to bridge that um, yeah now, can you pause it for one second i just have to go down there is something I want to close on with you. I think is really yeah. Really I'll just keep it running because otherwise I have two files. It's okay. okay.
So, um, an interesting point to make in correlation between regenerative practitioner training and the 12 step program. Mm -hmm. so I'm in these training sessions with Carol, and Carol mentored me quite a while when I was in Seattle. And every time I, I it, it would always like come up in conversation with her, with Pamela or Bill. Oh, that kind of sounds like AA. Oh, that sounds like kind of how I'm training in AA, or like how I do stuff in AA. And, I, and I'm on the calls with her, even during the regenerative practitioner training that I went through just to kind of see how they taught it. Um, I, I would say that a lot. And mm -hmm. then when I'd be in my breakout sessions, I'd be sharing, you know, 12 step experience stuff with the other peers in the room and talk about how I was trained. Whatever Carol was teaching, it's like, oh, I've actually, I came to that conclusion through my sobriety. You know? mm -hmm. Brought it up to Carol again, and she's like, "Oh yeah, that's because the same guy at Harvard who created that framework influenced Bill to create Twelve Steps, and influenced Charlie Crown. That's based on the regenerative practitioner training that we do. So the same guy at Harvard mm -hmm. developed the, that theory of change and framework that influenced the creation of the Twelve Steps. Is the same person that did, like Charlie Crone used that's influenced Pamela, Bill, and Ben on regenerative practice. So." From a governance perspective, I always like 12, AA is really interesting, it was, and, and NA, there's probably like 3 million people worldwide. It's not a huge amount of people, but it's self-governed. Yeah. There's no leaders, it's very democratic run, it's self-funded, there's exclusion of media, like the rules and traditions of the 12-step program or AA is really interesting to look at in context of how we structure society and decision making. Mm -hmm. um, but the principles and the steps are like destruction of the ego, not destruction, but it's a little much to tempering down of the ego and how I engage the world every day. I guess it's a, when I talk about with, when I'm teaching regenerative training, it's like I every day have to wake up and ground myself, right? And like put my feet on the ground and say, I belong to the earth and I'm in service to life. But I learned how to do that kind of stuff through AA when I have to wake up and read literature, call my sponsor and set my, like train my brain to, to to start the way I need to engage everyone around me that day or life around me that day. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm making sure that I'm not self-seeking. I'm making sure I'm not making decisions on my ego. I'm making sure I'm being in service to people around me. So it's the humility factor in that, the mentality, the mental model I start my day with, right? And it, I learned that in the 12-step program. Just, ha just by chance, my journey as a regenerative practitioner was so deeply aligned with that, but I had no idea. You know, mm -hmm. I'd always, how much it's helped me as a practitioner and a change agent because of my sobriety and the, and the, the learnings I got from becoming sober and using 12 steps. So there's some really interesting correlations there. It's fascinating because, uh, you know, so much of the, the, like, the framing of what's wrong with the degenerative human presence on earth is really, you could say we're, we're a heavily addicted culture to patterns right. of using more and more to fill gaps that you actually can't fill materially because you need to fill it in meaning and immaterially, but with re reconnecting to, to, to nourishing relationships to place and people. And, um, and so by unethical advertising that forces us to perceive how we should be, right? It's exactly. like this crazy conundrum. <laughs> So, so, so in many ways, to, to heal the, the patterns of degeneration in our globalized culture is, isn't it getting rid of an addiction. Um, so, so, that, so, so it kind of makes, makes perfect sense that, that there's a, a similarity. But what's, the name, what's the name of the, the, the guy who actually developed it at Harvard? You mentioned it's a uh, I, forget that. I have to text Carol for that. Yeah. I can't remember. Mm. Um, she would know. I'll, I'll email her. Maybe, maybe I can email her. And say, you, you know Carol, right? I'll email her and CC you. Not, not, not very well, but yeah, it's CC me. Like we're, we're, actually, I haven't, I've never talked to Carol um, personally yet. We've, we've had a couple of emails exchanges. Uh -huh. oh, man. She's uh -huh. interesting. So she does it. She's very candid, too. It's not like an open... It's like... A, this is the way you do it kind of thing. It's great. She's great. Yeah. She's, she's a really yeah, no, good, I, she's I, been my grand mentor for a long time. I, I, 
everybody who I've talked to about her um, who has had the privilege of being somehow mentored by her, being in the CAD, like the change agent development groups that, that she set up, um, deeply values what, what they get out of their conversations with her. From, from the, like, I need to make that step of actually having a conversation with her because I, looking from, from the outside, it is, is that prickly kind of maintaining the lineage and there, there's a bit of an energy that I perceive because I haven't really met her yet that, that, is, that reminds me of the old martial art um, kind of you have to empty your glass so I can fill it type um, approach of teaching. And um, that- Stuart's, Stuart's having a, um, an interesting dialogue about yeah. that with regards to the Common Earth Initiative. Uh, He's in Santa Fe, so he met with Pamela and Ben. It's, it, it, like it, it can't just be the regenesis way. You know, it's almost become cultish. Yeah, that's, uh, that's 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 the bit that I feel that I know she's not doing it out of ego trip, but it has it has a kind of cultish atmosphere around it. Like you're inducted into this group, and they, even the the promise. I mean, they're they're guarding how it's taught, and I I, I I was kind of a defender of that when people started talking about it down here, or someone was being slow and didn't talk about regenerative development. I, I would email Pamela and Ben and Bill, like, you guys know this guy. Mm. Like no, never heard of them. And I'm like, where'd you? And I was like, where do you, where'd you teach regeneration? It's like, oh, you know, I've been in the green building movement. I was like, have mm. you gone through training or anything? Like no. Yeah. Like a couple of times, I've had to step into a trade organization and say, no, nope. if you're going to talk about this topic, there's got to be protocols on how it's framed, how it's talked about, and and it builds off the people that have been working in the space for about 25 years, mm. not so you know, cowboy that just came out in the last couple of years and catch on this new term of generation. You know, this, is, this is what's happening everywhere around the world now, particularly in the business world. Everybody wants a piece of um, regeneration, this and the other. And, 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 and the, the typical consultants that, that jumped on smart and then sh jumped on circular or whatever, for a while it was biomimicry, um, just repackaged it and made it then their current offering and now trying to do exactly the same thing with regeneration not understanding that that there is a, is, is, a, is a depth of practice behind it that is um yeah. isn't just another part. I am as frustrated as i get with that and i feel like oh my god i've been doing this for so long i don't have a book and nobody knows i have to write a fucking book that's what i have you to do. do you do you do i know, I know. Because I just like, I'm like, how can I not be at the table for that? Like, I've been in this space for so long. Like, why aren't I invited to that? Like, uh, I get a lot of that. I need to write a book. But, but I'm also like backing away from certain things because of this privilege I had with, with working with Chels and Aboriginal you know, mm -hmm. people here. Because um, right now I'm like the adolescent again, mm -hmm. right? And I'm being taught all this knowledge and seeing how this knowledge has led to all these things that you and I have you know, seen grow over the last 50 years in the, in the modern standard of movement. So I think there's something deeper for us to take hold of. And I think I'll introduce you to Chels so you can, so what we want to do is create this, this online teaching platform. I don't know if it's Zoom or whatever, you might know some good ways to do it, but just, so, it, and it's, People can come into it, so she'll she'll create her network of Aboriginal First Nations teachers in New Zealand and Australia um, to link up and talk about marine custodianship and how they look at fisheries and how they look at food production and botany and bush tucker gardens, or how we look at communal housing and land management techniques and fire reading, whatever it might be. So there's all this teaching happening. Well, we have someone who's you know really advanced in the field from the Western perspective, also teaching with it. Mm. So you the perfect person to do that. Sounds amazing as a as a um, like a service to humanity almost um, building that program. <laughs> the way I see it is like that knowledge, indigenous Aboriginal knowledge systems and traditional agricultural practice could be the number one biggest export of Australia. Mm. 80,000 years of applied learning and how to live on this planet in a regenerative manner, mm. which is amazing. I mean, the, every day I learn something new and, and it helps me. I've almost become like a, rever a reverse racist, man. It's like, <laughs> I'm like fucking white people. <laughs> um, yeah, we, when we look at what we've done, we don't have it, a lot of stuff to justify our 
being sustained? I mean, this is this is the, the deep question that David Orr asked me 10 years ago, um, where he said, like, before we can answer what we might have to do and how we might create a sustainable human presence on Earth, we have to ask a deeper question, which is, why are we worth sustaining? And I think Aboriginal cultures have a lot more to answer, like, reasons why are they worth sustaining than, than our Western cultural track record. Um, the, that kind of degenerative, exploitative species behavior isn't worth sustaining. We, we really need to reinvent ourselves. Um, yeah, and there's a training, like I've had to go through training on this. There's a book called Decolonizing Solidarity. So it helps train and understand non-Indigenous people on how to be in service to dealing with Indigenous causes and movements. And that, that's helped me develop this level of respect and rapport mm -hmm. with Aboriginal Australians that most white Australians can't get. There's this like burdening guilt that contemporary Australians have about the past that they don't, maybe they don't want to engage it. There's also a deep lack of awareness about their own history and what happens here and, and the value of Aboriginal culture to our society. Um, or it's tokenistically applied through art and placemaking strategies mm -hmm. or name and place naming. So it's, it's missing this much deeper value impact it has. And, um, so we're just going on that journey now. It'd be awesome. I'll, I'll definitely set up a call with you and Jill so you guys can. Oh, that would be a gift. So I, I probably have to wrap it up. We've been talking for yeah. almost an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's been so nice to reconnect, particularly like we, we didn't have enough time in London. Um, to, to And hopefully this is the first of, of a number of ways of us to. Well, this is what you and I can collectively bring back to Calera. So I've been talking to Freya and Lola about this stuff and inviting Chels. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't lost on me in that room that a lot of that wisdom was First Nations people that, yeah. that day. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was the highlight of, of the event was, was particularly the New Zealand delegation. Um, yeah. yeah. And I have a strategy with the New Zealand government with them that we have a call in January to talk about. So it's, it's, we're moving forward on some stuff in New Zealand, which is good. Great. So I'll, I'll just stop the recording. Now.